From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome back to the show. My name is Noel. Our pal Matt is on adventures but will be returning soon. They call me Ben. We're joined as always with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Uh, Some of our fellow conspiracy realists listen to this show while playing a few of their favorite video games. And if you happen to fall into this category, uh, don't stop because this this is going to be a perfect episode for you. You might learn some things about the game you're playing. Uh, No, you know, like billions of other people around the world, uh, you, Matt... Doc, uh, maybe Paul, we haven't talked too much about it, uh, and myself are, are fans of video games. Sure. You know, what, what have you been playing recently? Yeah, I, mean, I would certainly consider myself like a fair weather gamer. Like I don't really, I kind of have like a handful of games that I play regularly that aren't like big long haul games, and then maybe one or two a year that are like big immersive games. And I oftentimes will get distracted and like it takes me ages to fi- to finish those games. Like I still haven't finished Fallout 4. <laughs> I think that game is like four years old at this point, but I love playing like Smash Bros and, you know, um, Mario Kart and things like that. And just like, you know, for fun here and there. Mm hmm. Yeah, and and that might be the a similar pattern for many people. You know, there are also people who say, I wouldn't really consider myself a video gamer, but I love this one app on my phone. And I play that pretty much, you know, whenever I have some idle time. Then there are other people who might say, uh, you filthy casuals, I am a ranked champion in StarCraft, you know? Right. And this, or StarCraft 2, excuse me. And this this idea for this episode came about, it was a long time coming, but uh, it was most recently inspired by a strange news segment we did a while back where we explored the Chinese government's newest bans, or not outright bans, but limits on gaming in uh, for, for younger demographics. And what they did essentially was they took rules that some people might have grown up with in their own in their own home, like parents saying, hey, you can only play games for like a few an hour or two after you finished your homework or it's the weekend. The Chinese government did this on a national level. They made it a law. So if you're under a certain age, I believe you're under 18, if you're a minor, you can only play video games in very online games in specific instances. And they portrayed this as a response to a domestic crisis, which they said was profound. They were implying that video games are dangerous addiction with wide-ranging consequences, and this prompted us to ask, well, are video games actually addictive? It's interesting. It's a very interesting question. We're going to get into a lot of uh, opinions about this because it's certainly something that's a relatively new question. I believe the World Health Organization only started to acknowledge this as a potential you know, mental health issue uh, very recently. But um, as far as the Chinese ban, I didn't realize that China is considered the world's largest video game market in terms of users, in terms of players. And they have been struggling or attempting to kind of control this for a long time. I, I didn't realize until we started looking into this that they actually banned consoles for, I think, 15 years. Um, and that is what led to the explosion of the mobile game phenomenon. So I think one of the companies called Tencent uh, that is considered one of the largest gaming operations in the world, um, huge in these online you know, phone games that are like things like League of Legends is one similar. I believe the one they have is something like clan of kings or something i'm not it's not my particular bag those games but um it's literally was a reaction to consoles being essentially outlawed um and it's a much lower barrier to entry for playing those phone games yeah and this is a natural evolution of something that makes sense but this is an evolution that is also accelerated over time in in a way that's going to be uh, pretty easy to track like you can start at the beginning here are the facts Video games have literally changed the world. 
Historians generally agree that the first thing we would call an actual video game was invented way back in 1958, which might surprise some people. There was a physicist named Williams Higginbotham who made a very, very, very bare bones version of electronic tennis while he was working at a place called the Brookhaven National Laboratory. Yeah, sort of as a, on a lark, kind of, with like sort of what would be considered this emerging technology of computers um, and computer programming, but it became very, very popular and folks, you know, in and around the lab would, would come and show up and play the game. Yeah, yeah. He originally, like, he didn't have this grand plan. He wasn't thinking this game, which I'll call Tennis for Two, is going to change the world. He thought, you know, every October... We have an open house at Brookhaven, and we have all these people come to visit us. And Higginbotham said to himself, I think it's a snooze fest. I want to show <laughs> off what I'm doing with the instrumentation group. And he's like, he had the logic of a, a kid who decides to build a volcano for a science fair. He's like, I want my exhibit to pop. So I need some interactive, and it'll also prove to people that all our egghead research we're doing – can have real relevance to society. And so he, uh, he partnered up with a technician and they actually, they built, uh, what is technically the world's first video game console. That's right. Um, and it was a pretty low tech, you know, I mean, considering what we have today device that really foreshadowed another uh, researcher or another like huge force in, in gaming development named Ralph Bayer, uh, who came out with something called Ralph Bayer's Brown Box um, in 1967 that ultimately went on to become the Odyssey, which was the very first um, even pre Atari home video game console. Yeah, yeah. And the Odyssey did not do very well in the market. The Brown, it, it was called the Odyssey when Magnavox bought it from Bear. And that's, this is the first, like you said, the first home video game console. And today it's regarded as a collector's item, right? For any student of video games. That's what happened. And there were a couple of other little things. Uh, just a few years before Higginbottom and his technician, uh, Robert Vorak, there was a British professor named A.S. Douglas who made a kind of tic-tac-toe as part of his dissertation at Cambridge. But still, you could look at this stuff, and unless you were a very future-minded person, you would think, ah, all right, flash in the pan. Uh, if you were somebody who thought that, however, you would be wrong. Today, video games are, they've, they've become mainstream. You know what I mean? It doesn't sound weird for someone to talk about a game that they like playing. And part of that is because uh, increasingly successive generations have grown up with video games. You know, 80s kids all remember some version of Super Mario, at least in the West. Oh, yeah. And if, if you, I mean, we're not going to focus too much on the history of video games today, but if you wanted to, there's a really cool Netflix documentary called High Score that I think we've all seen that, that covers a lot of this. And one of the very early games, too, right around the same time that we're talking about was called Space War. I just wanted to bring it up because it's Space War! Exclamation mark, And that was developed at MIT, along with a handful of other kind of lo-fi games that went on to be the predecessor for things like Pong and, you know, uh, Space Invaders and that kind of side-scrolling um, uh, game that we think of today that became, you know, things like Mario Brothers and all of that. And so when we talk about video games today, what we're seeing is this transformation, something that was once often regarded as a niche interest, like kind of on the same level of, I don't know, water polo or something, uh, or an amusement for children like hopscotch has blossomed. It is a global phenomenon. It's reaching nearly every aspect of the world of entertainment. As of 2020, just for a snapshot, the video game industry alone is worth an estimated $159.3 billion. The number is going to continue growing because there are somewhere around 2.69 billion gamers, and that's going to probably be 2.7 billion uh, within the very near future. 
Yeah, I and mean, it's a massive, massive industry that doesn't show any signs of slowing down, especially given, you know, the last couple of years with the pandemic and folks being kind of cooped up. I mean, it's, uh, I think, probably been a banner handful of years for the gaming industry. Um, but, you know, most gamers, whether you're maybe folks like us that are casual gamers of a particular app or, uh, you know, maybe you play a handful of Switch games, something like that, or if you're one of these esports folks that really goes super hardcore and takes it very seriously in high-level competitions. You can actually make a living, whether it be um, streaming yourself playing games on Twitch or actually winning big cash prizes in these competitions. Um, the fact of the matter is it's just another form of media that is ultimately entertainment, but it can also incorporate education. And of course, at the end of the day, it's supposed to ultimately be fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is this is something I want to hit. You know, it's it, it is important to understand video gaming as exactly a new form of media. I'd like to do a companion episode for this in the future called "The Future of Video Games," which is not necessarily what you think it might be. Uh, but either way, we, we know the ins and outs of the gaming industry, like any other industry, might have some skeletons in their digital closet. But if you're like most people playing a video game, you don't feel directly impacted by those things. You know, you're you want to get your gold star or you're after you're on the continual quest for that blue shell because that'll make the difference in the race. However, we do spend collectively a lot of time playing these admittedly brilliant games. As a matter of fact, this is a statistic surprised me. I, I don't know if it'll surprise anybody else. As of this year, the average gamer is believed to spend about eight hours and 27 minutes playing something each and every week. So for a lot of people, that's like, okay, you know, do you as long as it's not impacting your life. For some critics, however, this raises concerns about problems on the horizon. And when we say critics, we're not just talking about parents who are mad at their kids' Xbox habit. Uh, instead, we're talking about people, psychologists, experts, medical professionals who believe gaming could represent a new kind of danger. Well, and not to mention, you know, entire governments <laughs> in the case of uh, China, um, governments that actually are able to enforce some pretty draconian measures. And, and then as we've seen with the history we we're talking about at the top of the show, have been doing that for, for some time. And, are and just, the U.S. is not. Yeah, The U.S. is not because we are not what you would consider a uh, totalitarian government. I mean, certainly we have our moments, but all in all, we, we are still a democracy and we don't take particularly kindly to being told what we can and cannot do in our free time, um, even if it's about children, you know, with, with the best intentions. So, I mean, in the recent past, Past, we've certainly seen in the United States politicians raise concerns about violence in video games. Um, the notion that perhaps it could desensitize children who are maybe spending a little too much time playing Call of Duty and, you know, sniping people and this notion that uh, it kind of removes the um, empathy quotient from the act of killing. This is debatable, uh, but it certainly has there's been a lot of ink spilled over this and a lot of, uh, you know, um, discussions in the halls of, of government around this as well. Yeah, that's the thing. So I, I dug into this because it's a convenient boogeyman for politicians to say, hey, this new thing, this newfangled thing is the downfall of insert civilization here. And if you are a fan of video games, you can easily see how this may not always be a good faith argument. It can sound like just another tired iteration of other moral panics like, oh, heavy metal makes you crazy, or D&D makes you worship Satan. Uh, <laughs> these are things straight out of like Jack Chick comic strips, if anybody wants a fun trippy read later. The, the actual research, at least the stuff I found, says shows that the situation is not as cut and dry. Uh, things like the American Psychological Association will conduct meta studies, meaning they're studying other studies that have been conducted. And what they found is video games might be a contributing factor in a rise in violent behavior. It may even may even be a contributing factor in like immediate short term aggressive thoughts. But that would happen on an individual level. And it's only one of many, many possible variables. So you might play Call of Duty 
you know, slam some monster energy or in Matt's case, Dr. Pepper, zero sugar, and then <laughs> say that might be a risk factor for you for a little bit. You might feel kind of amped, but playing that game doesn't automatically mean you're going to say, okay, it's time to knock over a Walmart. Right. It's, I think, I mean, I think most people at this point in the, uh, in the discussion, you know, that we've been having for many, many years as a culture, uh, would probably see that side of it where, okay, maybe there is a, a child who's experiencing other risk factors, whether it's, you know, in maybe mental health issues that are outside of video games or problems at home or, you know, just some undiagnosed um, psychological issues that could then be triggered or exacerbated by excessive video game playing. Um, that certainly makes sense, but there are other factors that could, tr you know, figure into that as well, like violent movies or reading violent literature. I mean, it's interesting that we never talk about violence in books, you know? I mean, I know that we have in the past for sure, but it certainly doesn't seem to be as big of a, a controversy as it is with video games because for some reason books are seen as more innocuous because you have to use your imagination. It's not showing it all to you on a screen, but I would argue that books could maybe even be more dangerous in, in terms of giving people ideas uh, that they then act on um, because it really does get right inside your head as opposed to just giving you kind of a facsimile of, of violence. Throughout human history, since the dawn of writing, books have been some of the most dangerous technology that humans have ever invented. There's a reason some folks are so fond of burning them. Uh, they've at least been a danger to a status quo. But you, you make a good point here, Noel, and the, the pearl clutching, what always kills me about this is the pearl clutching about violence in some form of media is a tale as old as time. I would not be surprised if there was like some outcry when Gregorian chant supplanted old Rome chant and people were like, oh, these Gregorians, it's the end of the world. Uh, the real danger here according to the critics, is not, is not the old dead horse of violence in media. Instead, critics are alleging it's not that video games are violent. It's that they are addictive and dangerously so. What are we talking about? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsor. Here's where it gets crazy. So it was in 2018 that the World Health Organization, or the WHO, officially recognized something it is currently calling gaming disorder. And they defied this condition in, I don't know, what I thought was a pretty reasonable way. I thought it was, it was, a, it was like a Mad Lib definition of addiction with gaming slotted in. Yeah, they describe it as a condition, uh, quote, characterized by impaired control over gaming, um, not in terms of the inability to use your uh, controller, uh, but the inability of you to control your behavior, a uh, compulsion towards gaming. Uh, to continue with the quote, increasing priority given to gaming over other activities to the extent that gaming takes precedence over other interests and daily activities and continuation or escalation of gaming despite the occurrence of negative consequences so you your your partner broke up with you you lost your job right and each of and and your your car got repossessed if you got a car and each of those things just sort of pushes you to spend more time play playing a game that would be a loose definition of what they're talking about and they're not the first people to do, the first organization at least to describe this the american psychological association beat them to the punch they already cited something similar they called it internet gaming disorder in the dsm-5 which is like the collection of what it considers to be conditions or disorders and i think the specificity of internet gaming disorder is Interesting, that nuance. We'll, we'll see why in a second. Uh, but before anybody panics, and before you go, don't, if you have kids, don't go grab your kids' video games. Let, let them have fun because the APA and the WHO both note, and they take pains to note, that gaming as an addiction, if you look at it through this lens, likely only affects a very small amount of gamers. The vast majority are just enjoying a hobby. It's just they're kicking it with some recreation. That's right. Um, it, it goes back to kind of what we were talking about at the top, where 
ultimately psychologists um, have figured out that these, uh, these these triggering behaviors that could be caused by violent video games or other media are likely only affecting a small percentage of individuals rather than a culture at large. Um, and those individuals are likely suffering from other conditions to begin with that are then being exacerbated or triggered by, you know, the other stimuli, you know, from, from games or what, what have you. So it's a very similar situation. Um, you're not instantly going to be someone who's has an addictive personality for anything. Um, some people can drink uh, socially, smoke socially, even partake in uh, drugs socially, um, and not ever go full bore over the cliff of addiction. Yeah, just say, look, you know, if you're in a, spoilers, but if you're in a part of Super Mario where you jump on Yoshi and betray him to jump a little bit further, that doesn't mean you're going to automatically say, I should kill every lizard. I should just ride this out. This is my thing now. I am the lizard <laughs> Armageddon. That's, that's preposterous to phrase it in that manner. And unfortunately, at times... Uh, when convenient, some public figures have done just that. So this is this is where we get to what changed. So for a long time, the, the concerns about this were relatively overblown. Uh, there wasn't the kind of technology in place that would enable this to occur on, on a large scale. It shouldn't be a surprise. We got to defend video games and video gamers and uh, the people who create these. It should not be a surprise that companies and designers want to make games compelling. After all, you're asking people to give the most valuable currency in the modern day their free time. So you want it to feel like they're doing something enjoyable and it's tough to blame game creators. I would say it's ridiculous to blame game creators for trying to do a good job. That's kind of dumb. It is, but but it's also like you said, games have changed the world and games are continuing to change as technology advances. So where it used to be, you'd get the game and the game was the game. Now, you know, you're going to get all of these micro releases that, that accompany the game uh, that, that often goes on for months and months and months of additional content, um, you know, added bonus levels or, you know, downloadable content. DLC is what they call it, of course. Um, um, but with these phone games and in general, the the stuff from the phone kind of made its way into console games. Those were all based on they're like free to play. Uh, and then you get these little rewards, um, whether for, you know, time spent or whatever it might be. And some of them, you know, do cost money. And that's how these companies make their money. But a lot of them are just kind of little ways to give you an extra little endorphin boost. And this is what you might call, I guess, the the freemium approach to gaming design. Right, Ben? Yeah, it is the freemium approach to gaming design. I mean, it is free to play. But if you want to do well in the game, then you are going to be spending either a ton of time or you're going to be spending real money, uh, preferably a combination of both, to make some progress. And just for uh, perspective there, in the world of mobile gaming, as of just a few years ago, I think it was a very small proportion of gamers in the mobile space, only about 0.15% bring in 50% of the profits for those developers. They're called whales, and you can see why. So a lot of things in mobile gaming are, are a numbers game meant to get a piece of the that 1.5% of the game playing population's wallet. And so much stuff goes into this, so much thought and time. The people who are uh, very well-versed in psychology – are increasingly going to be game developers, uh, and they're going to be working with behavioral psychologists in particular. The average person might be kind of surprised to learn just how much thought goes into designing games specifically to feed upon and exploit what we know about human psychology. And that's why we were talking about how video games and slot machines share these core commonalities. It's weird, there was a great article I read it was older, but it's it's uh, still very much it's still very much relevant uh, by a guy who's working at Microsoft, and he talks not in terms of making a fun game, but in terms of mapping out what he calls patterns of activity from a structural level. So he takes three things: the amount of time you spend, 
your activity, what you're doing, and your reward, what you get for that. Uh, this activity plus time equals reward. And together, this kind of equation creates what he called a contingency. And the idea admittedly owes a ton to B.F. Skinner. Uh, he is the one who's often credited with discovering the power of stimulus and reward. And so if you're not a big fan of video games, you might say, well, I mean, what's the point? Sure, you make a game and you know somebody typically has to spend X amount of hours doing Y amount of things before they get, you know, uh, the magic sword of blubba dubba or whatever. If we're still doing the blubba dubba. Oh, we are. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> Forever. Then, then if you don't play games, you might say like, you might have a conversation with a friend or a loved one who is like, oh man, I finally got the, the sword of blubba dubba. And you're like, well, it's, it's not a real sword. Well, it's a sword of the mind, though, right? Exactly, I mean, to your mind, literally. it is absolutely a real sword. And these are the same kinds of things that we saw uh, and, and have read about, but specifically in the Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, that talks about the design of social networks um, they and, and phones even. The interface of a, 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 a smartphone operates on the same principles. It's trying to keep you engaged on that device or in that network for as long as humanly possible. In order to do that, it games a lot of of these psychological uh, systems, or these systems in your brain um, that are stimuli uh, and reward. Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Because it, here's the thing. When you have dedicated time to something, if you are a human being, your brain becomes convinced that you have earned it. The same way that your brain, when you just make yourself laugh, your brain can't tell the difference between that and genuine laughter, at least when you're doing it. We That's why laughter at, therapy is such a big thing, because it actually reward, gives you a sense of um, positive vibes, I guess, that you can kind of impose on yourself. I mean, I'm, I'm, that's not a psychological term, but the idea is that if you make yourself laugh or just choose to laugh uncontrollably, it has a positive reward um, effect on the brain, but not necessarily in the same kind of more cracky kind of stimuli ways that we're talking about with games and social networks. Not quite. Yeah. Like I was saying, uh, the, the caveat I always add when I, when I tell people about that is you are probably very good at sensing fake laughter in others, mm -hmm. just not in yourself. So don't, don't go trying to be slick. Okay. Unless it's really worth it. But in the, in the sense of this, in this context, video games, because the human brain will become convinced kind of like a, a type of sunk cost fallacy. They'll say, well, we've spent 20 hours getting this amazing sword or this armor or this gold um, uh, gold shoulder pad or whatever. Sure. So your brain says you've earned it and therefore because you have earned it, it is worthwhile. And you still get those good vibes, those endorphins. Uh, you Like getting a sword in, in the game for your brain feels equivalent to getting one in real life. And it shouldn't be dismissed because as far as – you know, if we're going to believe in Descartes, and I think therefore I am, as far as your internal thoughts and experiences, both swords are equally real and valid. Sure. Or there's other uh, philosophers, I believe Leibniz, maybe there's one, and there's a whole school of them, but the idea of what is perception, you know, is this all just kind of like a simulation, not, not simulation theory, but the idea that the universe as we perceive it or our surroundings that we perceive it, um, there's really not much difference between the the way our brain perceives it and the way our brain perceives a simulation of it. Because as far as our brain's concerned, it's kind of all the same. Right. And so if we go back to the work of B.F. Skinner, and this is, this is going somewhere, this is worthwhile. So imagine a mouse. This mouse is in a cage. This cage has a button. Let's say, let's say um, uh, the mouse is named Rupert. And whenever Rupert pushes Rupert's little mouse button, he gets a treat. There are so many, there are innumerable variations on this type of experiment. But in the case of video games, from the designer's perspective, you are the mouse if you are the player. And the, the cage is the game. And the lever is the controller, or your means of interaction. And instead of food, you receive whatever that particular game defines as an award every time, you know, depending on the combination of moves you make with your lever or controller, Unlike those poor, poor rodents in the world of Skinner experiments, you are able to leave the cage. 
you can turn off the game. And so game creators spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to make sure you don't. That exactly. all changed. Exactly. Yeah, that all changed once online gaming started. Oh, in a huge way, because as we said, um, it became much more about how can we keep you in this game environment for as long as possible? And the answer to that is, what if we designed a game that never ended? You know, instead of just the game is the game. Well, now the game just goes on forever and there's other people you're interacting with. And it's essentially just this world that you've immersed yourself in that short of bodily functions and needing to maybe eat and drink and stuff. You don't really ever have to leave because it's certainly checking the box for a lot of your uh, social interactions and it's giving you that reward system. So you just feel so good. Who would ever want to leave? Yeah, exactly. Uh, not to date anybody in the crowd, but some folks listening today are old enough to remember when the process of gaming was this. If you didn't go to an arcade, if you were playing a game at home, you bought it as probably a cartridge or maybe a CD or something, and you played it till you gave up, you got bored, or you won. And then sometimes you'd fall in love with the game, you might play it again a second, third, or multiple times, but mostly when you reach the end of a game, you were pretty much done with it. There wasn't really an option to, like, just keep walking around. And when, like you said, Noel, with uh, MMORPGs in specific, massive multiplayer online role-playing games, uh, these games didn't have to end, and then... There was a tremendous profit opportunity. Now, instead of having somebody pay, you know, their 50 bucks or whatever for a game, they pay an ongoing subscription fee. And then just like in mobile gaming, they can pay more for various perks, items, cosmetic improvements. And so to maximize someone's involvement, designers had to do something different. They had to change the game of making games. They had to make sure the game didn't just continue forever but that it also had the patterns of reward, the contingency structured such that uh, the, the game itself was compelling enough to keep people coming back even when there wasn't necessarily new amazing stuff to do. This is where we get the concept of grinding. You just say if I, you know, like, um, for example, in Skyrim, if you want to level up your blacksmithing, you just make the easiest blacksmithing item over and over and over which is a dagger, I think. It's also a way to just level up your character, too. Like they're, and they're, and like you, you figure out different tricks and um, you know, to, to get the, uh, the path of least resistance to getting the most um, XP in the shortest amount of time. But then you have people like, you know, there are certain games where to maybe folks like you or I, Ben, we'd be pretty satisfied just completing the game, like uh, Red Dead Redemption. But within a game like that, um, there are all of these little, um, like, awards or what do you call mm -hmm. them like medals I'm, I'm, achievement I'm, achievement exactly achievement unlocked uh and they don't really give you anything other than just the bragging rights of saying you 100 percent finished the game um <laughs> and, and 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 then if you start adding in all of this downloadable content and extra stuff there it, it might be absolutely um impossible to ever say you 100 percent completed the game but some people's brains are constantly seeking out that 100% completion. So that part of their brain is totally being gamed and hijacked by the gaming companies continuing to add more stuff to it. And people eat it up. They don't look at it as a negative. They look at it as a feature. Yeah, I'm getting more stuff. I already paid. Now I'm getting more stuff. And let's be honest, I think I can't be the only one who's had this experience. You might have been playing a game and you got some sort of notification that you've achieved a badge, you've gotten a trophy or uh, some sort of kudos for something you never imagined possible. It's like, aha, you've got the bird watcher badge because you have seen every bird in this game at right. some point. E even if you don't care, people love feeling accomplished. So you're like, oh, yeah, I guess I. I have. And they get really niche too, really specific, like, oh, you killed 1,500 enemies using a uh, long range sniper weapon with the laser scope. And there, you know, there are these for every type of weapon, for every environment, for every type of enemy, for every type of piece of armor. I mean, there's got to be a whole division of these game companies that all they do is come up with those <laughs> types of achievements. Such a fun idea for a job, you know, and they've got funny titles too. Like you might get one that says Creepster, you exactly. have touched 200 elbows right? in exactly. the game. And, and you're like, well, I didn't know. That's really more on the controls than it is on me. Jeez, guys. But, but this is true. This is um, 
this is a strategy that works. And again, this does not make the game developers in any way evil. There are people trying to do a good job at their job. And this doesn't mean that the people playing these games are suckers. They're enjoying what they're doing. And again, we are we are in that latter group. We enjoy playing these video games. But there was opportunity created with the concept of the never-ending game. There was opportunity both for um, exacerbating possible uh, problems with addiction, and there was, of course, the uh, opportunity to get a little bit deeper into people's wallets, and then another plot twist came about, and it's one that you and I talked about briefly off-air, which is, okay, so 2019 or so, online gaming is a thing. There are some people who only play games online, right? Sure. They're like, I don't really like games, but I love World of Warcraft or League of Legends or Fortnite. And then a pandemic hits. Right. It sure did, um, which I think is the ultimate plot twist here. Um, and again, a very recent one that we still haven't seen the other side of. I mean, we're still in it. Uh, the coronavirus kept tons of people at home. Um, the idea of like, you know, away time from your gaming system became at least temporarily a, a thing of the past, right? The idea of go play outside, go play with your friends, you know, go see people. Well, all of a sudden, anyone who maybe was inching towards being a bit of a gaming recluse almost had like a pass, a free pass to just f go all in um, because school went online um, and, and leisure really became something that if your parents weren't being very active in regulating the time spent on screen, you could just easily fall down that rabbit hole, especially considering that it was now school was like 100 percent in these little boxes and accountability was a lot harder. Like I, I have a kid and uh, during the beginnings of the pandemic, when she was in school, it was really hard to make sure she was on task because I can't be there looking over her shoulder every second. Um, and it was also a very new thing for the teachers. So there was a lot of new technology and software they were using and it was chaos. Uh, and, you know, there's a whole South Park episode about it where Cartman would just literally put up a picture of himself and he would just play video games or do whatever he wanted and just pretend to be in school. So a lot of uh, any opportunistic kids that maybe tried to skirt their school responsibilities, this was like absolute, you know, fantasy land for them. Yeah, I uh I haven't made it a secret. I have a lot of teachers in my life um and I'm I'm immensely privileged to say I'm friends with a lot of educators and they are some of the most important people in any civilization and they're often unfortunately some of the most put upon oh, yeah. people in any civilization. Uh and this was enormously stressful for everyone involved, the kids, the parents, the teachers, the educators. Uh, and one thing a lot of people didn't acknowledge in the beginning was if you're working from home, yeah, it's great to have a job, but you're also really taking work into your house. You're turning your home into an office and you don't usually have kids in the office, right? At your, your job, probably. And uh, school and daycare become unviable. People are looking for a way to keep these kids entertained without, you know, everybody having cabin fever and biting each other's heads off. And that's when you come to researchers like a psychologist from Maryland, Edward Spector, who says that this has shifted already the rough demographic of what he would see as people likely to have gaming addiction or develop it. He said, what, you know, it's always a small minority, but one, once upon a time, pre-pandemic, this demographic tended to be people of college age. And now, due largely, he argues, uh, to the pandemic, this demographic has shifted toward teenagers or even younger children. And while this pandemic will pass, another one will definitely come Sorry, it's true. Uh, yeah. It, it does, doesn't mean these kids are going to be able to instantly unplug, you know what I mean, and go back to life as it was before. I don't think anyone will. No, and again, like you said, it shifted that age um, to it started to cause it to skew much younger. I mean, in, in this op-ed piece he wrote for the Washington Post, Spencer talks about how it even has shifted to like infants, you know, and I, I've seen it. Uh, it. It's no better babysitter than the old iPad uh, for a small child with like um, shows like Coco Melon and things that are, you know, cute and maybe a little bit educational in some small way, but 
at the end of the day. So weirdly they're... sinister, like baby well, shark. Yeah, like, totally what? sinister. But like, you know, there's also games that are designed for very, very small children. And when you start really looking at the psychology of it, you're introducing that kind of reward system and that instant gratification of like, give me the good feels while your brain is still developing. Um, right. That's exactly kind of bad news. Right. Because it starts to make it where like you're only good at something if it instantly rewards you and it starts to kind of reward you for not putting in the time to actually get good at a skill. Because I don't know, I, I, I don't, I'm not meaning to soapbox here, but I've just I've definitely seen it and it's troubling. Um, I It's troubling. It's also troubling. I, I mean, it's troubling from an experiential level. For many people, I imagine it's also troubling in that there hasn't been enough time to conduct rigorous science on these long term effects. Right. It's it's going to take a long time, like decades for people to know what was affected and to what degree. But that's the lay of the land. So we're going to pause for a word from our sponsor. I hope it's a video game company. Uh, we'll be right back to unpack what this all means. We've returned. In sum, yes, there is a kind of conspiracy afoot. Uh, yes, Virginia, there is a conspiracy Santa Claus here. Leveraging what we understand about human psychology, using the exact same knowledge so effectively leveraged in the world of gambling and in the world of advertising, game developers know what makes your reward system tick. They know how to scratch you right behind the cognitive ears. And just like Skinner with some mice, they can teach you to do tricks for treats. Totally. I wanted to mention earlier just something that's really big in, in these types of games are uh, what's called loot boxes, where you get like a kind of a blind box of like, it's got stuff in it, but you don't know what it is. And the monetary value, like, in, you know, if in like in-game currency or whatever, for one of the items could be really high, uh, or it could be just some run-of-the-mill, you know, widgets that you get to maybe get give you one ups or something like that. But that um, gamble is something that affects your brain. Like you it really does feel like you're gambling uh, and that just adds to the impulsivity of it all. And then the need to keep trying again. So maybe you'll get the good loot this time, you know? Right. Um, so they are very aware of what they're doing. And you know, that extends to even like things in the physical world. There's like blind boxes where you can buy it for a set price and maybe you get the special uh, gilded Pokemon or whatever. Yeah, but like it, a mystery Funko. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, this is something, you're, you're right, game developers know this, and they are doing it, and that that mystery is, is part of it, because human beings in, um, in, in this sort of scenario tend to think a little bit less about all the times they wasted money on something, whether a slot machine or a loot box, and remember the times they hit it big. And psychologists, at least in the world of gaming and developers, have figured out what the acceptable win to loss ratio is that'll keep you going, that'll keep you hooked. Uh, there, again, this is the thing that gets me. It is not necessarily evil, it's not inherently malevolent. I mean, I was trying to think of a good analogy. Think of it this way, fellow conspiracy realists. If game developers were making shoes instead of games, wouldn't they want the shoes to be comfortable? If you're making shoes, don't you want to make the kind of shoes that people like to wear and walk around in? That's, that's kind of the same thing. They want a game that people like to live in and like to spend time with. And this is, this is all, again, this is not to say that Every video game manufacturer, every mobile game manufacturer is intentionally trying to get people addicted, but it does set the stage for addiction to occur. And one big part of this problem, the reason it's been ignored for a while, is that there are a lot of misconceptions about addiction. And I appreciated, Noel, when you pointed out uh, just a couple of those. But first, I feel like we shouldn't even have to say this, but just to be very clear, Addiction is in no way a moral failing. It is the result of many different factors, and it also doesn't necessarily need a physical component. 
It doesn't even need a physical dependence, right? No, I mean, honestly, in many cases, the psychological dependence can be more powerful than the physical dependence. And the physical dependence is just kind of a byproduct of that. I think many would argue that marijuana, for example, is not physically addictive. If you smoke marijuana and then you stop, you're not going to like get the shakes or something or like have some sort of, you know, like nausea or like withdrawals, right? But uh, it is very psychologically addictive. And if people are convinced that they are better or they're happier when they're in this state, then that psychological uh, component is hugely powerful. Uh, and the same goes with any kind of addiction, including games. Um, it's interesting. Robert West, who's the editor in chief of the scientific journal Addiction, um, he says that it's really more about what you do how you act, you know, once you are quote unquote addicted or, or rather it's a spectrum and more severe addictions are accompanied by self damaging behavior or behavior that can really cause problems in people's social lives and family lives and, uh, and work lives. Yeah. Something that can lead to negative outcomes is the way we put it. And this guy is uh, the editor in chief of the scientific journal addiction. So he is, he knows Pretty much an expert. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so he, yeah, he knows he he knows what he's talking about. But uh, this this leads us to something else. You know, when when we're talking about behavior, that's something that people get addicted to. Ritual is can be addictive to folks because it is predictable. It is comforting. It reminds you of how you felt the last time you engaged in it. And the newest definitions of gaming disorder or internet gaming disorder, whichever term you prefer, seem to fit well within that understanding. There's not a silver bullet, one-size-fits-all description. Like, you cannot automatically say somebody is addicted to gaming or a game just because they like it. They might play tons of games. They might spend tons of time on a single game. And I say this as a guy who did get to 100% completion on Skyrim. It took forever. I'm never going to do that again with a game. But... That same person may not be addicted because it isn't having a negative consequence on their life. It's just something they really enjoy doing. And that's where we have to ask ourselves that question at the beginning. Is this to some degree a moral panic? The answer seems, I, honestly, in some cases, yes. Sure. Like the best research finds that maybe 1% to 3% of gamers, and this is the best current research, um, one to three percent of gamers are, quote, at risk for addiction. And these are real people and this can be a real problem. But that doesn't mean that everyone who got super into Minecraft uh, during the Rona is suddenly hung up on what a couple of reporters have even described as digital heroin, you know, and you can feel attacked. There, there are people who are like, I my if I have one vice, it's a video game. I don't drink. I don't smoke. You know, I'm out. I'm not out whiling. I'm I'm at home working on you know my newest playthrough of GTA. Uh, that you can feel like you're being attacked, as though your hobby is being stigmatized. But here's what the WHO is really saying. I keep wanting to call it who, but WHO is really saying this is. They're listing this and acknowledging it as just a way of defining, understanding the problems so that they can take better steps in understanding how to address it. So don't worry. Big government's not coming for your PS4. Not just yet. Totally. I mean, at least big government here. Um, and in, in China, you know, there, there's certainly – we've read a few op-eds from psychologists that we've – one of which we cited, the Edward Spector one for the Washington Post, that kind of – criticizes the approach that the Chinese government is taking. Um, they are treating it, in, in the opinion of, of some of these researchers, as a moral panic. And I love the way Spectre puts it, where he makes the point, it's similar to the case with any prohibition or outright, um, you know, outlawing or banning of a thing that people like to do is, uh, you know, when you tell someone they can't do something, they're just going to spend twice as much energy trying to figure out how to do it. Anyway, um, so with kids, for example, you know, we've we've done ads for these like VPNs, you know, um, are, are huge where you can trick uh, systems that would maybe be designed to cut you off after a certain amount of playtime. Um, you can just reroute it and make it seem like you're in a different country uh, that isn't subject to the same, you know, um, conditions or uh, use a parent or grandparent or older brother's account. Um, and, you know, this company Tencent that we talked about, the online gaming company that's massive. 
uh, out of China, they're working on technology that uses facial recognition to really take this to the next kind of surveillance nanny state kind of place. But again, um, Spectre argues that it's more about media um, awareness and kind of having this conversation and figuring out how to kind of just like limit yourself and and have a more of like a healthy, balanced diet of media rather than, you know, outright banning kids from playing these games because they're they're smart. Kids are smart and they're just going to figure out how to get around it or they'll just watch other people play on YouTube. Like, how do you are you going to also filter Twitch streams so that kids can't watch other people play? That still triggers similar um, endorphin responses, even if you're not the one pressing the button. I think that's why those are so popular. Yeah. So all good points. Like I'm saying, no big government is coming for your PS4 just yet. But if they were coming for your PS5, I assure you it's only because they couldn't get their hands on one themselves. That's still incredibly ridiculous. But just as real as the microchip shortage is, the problem looming on the horizon is itself real, and there's not an effective way to legislate it on a large scale, at least in the U.S. It would be virtually impossible because what would you be doing at that point? You would either be restricting people's personal freedoms or you would be, what, making some sort of law that says if you're a game developer, you can't make your game entertaining or compelling in a certain way. That's a lot like saying, hey, shoemakers of the world, these shoes are too comfortable. Start making them kind of crappy, you know, for the greater good. Exactly. Just like have them come with like pebbles in the bottom of them that you can't take out, you know, or a thumbtack or something. Um, it's true. And, and, you know, as I said, even in China, the technology isn't quite all the way there for them to really do this in the way they're wanting to do it. And you're, they're going to need the uh, assistance of these game developers. Um, and there's even calls in the States for game developers to maybe start helping out with some of these problems a little bit, make it easier easier for parents to, you know, at their own discretion, limit screen time, uh, make it a little harder for kids to get around that stuff. But the legislation, of course, as it always does, inevitably lags behind technology. So it is ultimately up to the developers to kind of spearhead this stuff. And uh, this is the same thing that's happening in the world of gambling and in the world of advertisement. With this in mind, uh, we do hope that you check out our future episode on the future of video games, which we'll definitely have to have uh, Matt Frederick in for. And the last thing we want to end on whenever we do an episode touching on topics like addiction is this. If you are struggling or if someone you care about is struggling with addiction of any sort, there is help out there. You are not alone. It might sound corny when people say it, but it only sounds corny because it is true. If you struggle with addiction, uh, if you, you know, let's be honest, rates of certain vices and, and problems have skyrocketed during the Rona. So if you find yourself affected by this, don't hesitate. Please reach out to any of the many helplines and resources that are available for you and for free. You are worth it. I always like to recommend the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration here in the U.S., SAMHSA. Uh, their national helpline, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is 1-800-662-4357. That's 1-800-662-4357. Help, H E L P. Definitely a great resource if you're finding yourself in a situation where you do feel alone and you need someone to talk to. Um, but let us know: is this something that you've struggled with um, during the pandemic or otherwise? Is this something that you even think is an issue? Uh, you can reach us in all of the usual internet places of note. That's right. You can find us on places like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, and if you say, you know, I'm more of a phone person, I would much rather prefer just to leave a message. We've got you covered there too. We have a real life phone number. That's right. It's one eight three three S T D W Y T K. You've got three minutes to leave your voicemail and let us know what to call you. Give yourself a killer nickname or uh, just let us know what you're comfortable with. We can also go with anonymous. And if you're cool with us using your message on air and you may hear yourself in one of our weekly listener mail episodes. And if that's not your bag, any of those things, you can also contact us a somewhat old-fashioned way. You can send us a good old email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com.
Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.